Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Councillor James Pasternak, and I'm the Chair of North York Community Council. The Clerk has confirmed that we have quorum, so I'd like to call the meeting 16 to order. Welcome, everybody. This meeting is being held using the City's WebEx technology with members and staff connecting a video conference or calling in. Because we're meeting remotely, we ask for your patience with any delays or technical issues. Members of the public can observe the meeting on YouTube. We currently have several registered speakers who have been connected to the meeting by audio. I'd like to request that staff keep their video turned off unless they need to speak or answer questions. And this will make it easier for me as chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe members as they participate in the debate on each item and during votes. I also ask that all members and staff keep their microphones on mute unless you need to answer a question or speak. If any members do wish to speak on an item, please make sure your video is on, raise your hand or unmute your mic and indicate your intention to speak and I will create the speaker's list. In voting, I ask that members make sure that your video is turned on and, of course, raise your hands to indicate your vote. Members, I want to remind you that although we are participating remotely, you must still submit your motions in writing to the clerk. The clerk's staff are available by email at nycc at toronto.ca. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the Community Council would like to acknowledge the land we are on. It's the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Ashinawabi, the Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? I see none. In fact, I only see two councillors here. Um, there, three. Okay, um, and we need a motion to confirm the minutes from the last meeting of June the 16th, 2020. Also move, Councillor okay. Cole. Okay, uh, Councillor Cole. This last all, meeting. all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So why don't we um, go through the agenda and uh, try and work through non-timed items. Uh, so item one is the time for 9.45. We're a few minutes away from that. Item two is Ward 15, uh, part lot control exemption 103 uh, Bayview. It's uh, Councillor Robinson, and I have instructions on here to move staff recommendations. Also move, Councillor Cole, I'll move staff recommendations for uh, uh, IY16.2. Right, so all those in favor? Opposed, uh, that is carried. Item number three, final report, part lot exemption. Uh, William Duncan, um, William Duncan Road, Stanley Green, Block G. Uh, I will move the staff recommendations, it is Ward 6. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed, uh, that is carried. Item four is a timed item uh, for Deputy Mayor uh, Minna Wong. Item five, preliminary report, 5800 Young Street. Uh, that is Councillor Filling, who is not here yet. Uh, what we can do is hold the item, hold the item down, and we'll deal with it when Councillor uh, Councillor Filling arrives. Um, 16.6, request for fence exemption. Uh, rear yard, we do have a speaker on that item. Uh, so we'll hold that item down. It's also time for 10 o'clock. 16.7, uh, request for fence exemption. 16, uh, Lee Croft Crescent. Uh, it is Councillor Robinson. Uh, it's a timed item, so for 10 o'clock, and that is there's no direction on that item uh 16.8 okay okay so we have speakers on 15 and 16. 
Uh, so we'll hold those items down. And uh, next item is item 17. Is it a timed item? No. No. Um, sorry, Councilor Cole, residential demolition, 515 Glen Karen. What would you like to do with this item? Uh, I would uh, just like to hold that for the time being. Item 18, uh, 226 Wilson Avenue, Bell Mobility License Agreement. It's Councillor Cole. Yes, uh, I, I will uh, move staff recommendation. Okay, staff recommendations moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item uh, 19, designation of fire route, amendment to chapter 880, fire route 65 Forest Manor Road, Councillor Carroll. Move adoption. Adoption is moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item 20, uh, also fire routes, uh, wards 8, 15, 16. Um, Councillor Cole, would you like to move this on behalf of Councillor Robinson and Deputy Mayor Minnewong? I'll move adoption uh, for item uh, IY 16.20. Okay. Fire routes. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, item 21. Uh, also, fire routes on a series of streets here. Several councillors involved. Um, I would have our vice chair move it. Councillor Carroll, do you want to move this on our behalf? You're in this list too. Absolutely. Move adoption. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. So we can go back to the. Oh. New business. So, Councillor Carroll, I understand you have an item. Would you like to uh, I do, uh, um, introduce it? I'd like to make a new item 22. It's a, it's a, a minor uh, parking amendment. Okay. All those in favor of adding it to the agenda? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. And uh, there was a, a, just a technical error in one of my items from the last meeting. Uh, a street was left out, I believe, in a direction for traffic calming. So I'd like to reopen that item and then add it to the agenda for the technical change, the technical I'll move direction. to uh, reopen. Uh, Councillor Cole has moved to reopen. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So our uh, first timed item is item number one at 945. Uh, we do have a speaker. For that, are they? We're we're a couple minutes away. Yeah, we, have three minutes, yeah. we have to wait. We have to wait three minutes. So you might want to walk the dog. Or oh, Councillor Fillion is here. Okay, that's great news. Um, we held a couple of your. We're could, we're having trouble hearing you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, you're you're having trouble hearing. Yeah. How's that? Is that a little better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, Councilor Fillion might have a motion on item five, the preliminary report. Yeah, so Councilor Fillion, we did hold item five down, uh, 5800 Young Street. What, what would you like to do with that item? Again, Mr. Chairman, if you could mic up better, uh, you're very muffled. Um, okay. We gotta buy this guy some pods. Yeah, how's that? Is that a little better? Fantastic. Yeah, that's clearer. Okay, I'm trying to lean in a little bit here. I'd rather be lying down, but I'm leaning in. Put in some huh? or something. Put on a microphone. Okay. Um, item five, um, Councillor Phil in 5800 Young Street. Yeah, hi. Sir. So, um, okay, I'm trying again. Can you um, hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes. We can hear okay. you, John. Okay, thanks. So I, um, I'm referring it back to staff, but I haven't sent anything to the uh, clerk's table yet. Oh, you have a motion for this item? Yeah, a short one. I'm having a lot of trouble. The screen is flashing with uh, multiple people's pictures. Um, 
Anyway, I just have to send a quick motion to the uh, to the clerk, and then we can deal with it. Unless I can do it verbally, but I don't think I can. Right? Uh, is it a deferral or a referral? Or is it's it... a referral back to staff. Okay. Um, staff say we can do that verbally, and then uh, they'll they'll draft okay. up the motion later. Uh, yeah. So this is to refer back to staff. Uh, item number five, 5800 Young Street. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is uh, carried. I think we can go to our first item now, can't we? <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, so we do have a deputant. I, I hope... Um, I hope that person is on the line. Uh, Saruj uh, Kalistinian from HSK Design. HSK Design. Yes. Inc. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, thank you very much for coming. You have Can five you... minutes. Well, uh, I just uh, wanted to join as a speaker to inform you guys if you need any questions, particular about our application, I'd be more than happy to answer. Okay, uh, that was the shortest deputation uh, we've had in several years. Um, are there are there any are there any questions for the deputant? And I was going to move staff recommendations. It's it's a ward six item. Um, any questions for the deputant on this item? No. Any questions for staff? Any speakers? No? Okay, I was going to, um, I was going to move the staff recommendations. All right, okay. so all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item four, um, Deputy Mayor Minna Wong, um, timed item, I do have, um, I do have a deputant on the list is Cynthia McDougall from McCarthy Titro, LLP. Ms. McDougall, are you on yes. the line? Ms. McDougall? Sorry, yes? Oh, Ms. McDougall? Yes, we can yes. now. Uh, you, Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, Thank you very much. You have five minutes. Thank you. I represent the owner of the Crosstown Lands, which is at Don Mills and Eglinton, and used to be known as the Celestica Lands. Um, what I'm indicating today is reflected in my letter is uh, we support the staff recommendations as amended on July 14, 2020. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, at the Toronto Preservation Board, there were original staff recommendations and then there were some amendments by the Toronto Preservation Board. And since then, we've been working closely with staff and they made some technical amendments to the recommendations, which are reflected in the recommendations today, which were posted yesterday. So the, the simple request is, is if you would support the staff recommendations. Uh, we believe that appropriately implements um, the heritage preservation that's appropriate on the site. The difficulty I'm having is, is that the way things are formatted on the website, and I'm not sure it's the same for you as it is for me, but the Toronto Preservation Board recommendations um, are yeah. not superseded totally. So, so what I want to ensure is that the recommendations as uh, altered by staff yesterday go forward as a piece and that, that you don't move the Toronto Preservation Board recommendations because they're in conflict with each other. And uh, so that's, that's my short request and I don't want to take up any more time because perhaps I don't need to and I don't want to waste your time. 
with respect to this matter in terms of getting into any further details. So I look to the local councillor, uh, Councillor Min and Wong, whether or not I need to go further. Okay, um, thank you very much. Are there any questions for the deputant? No questions of staff. Okay, well, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll do the deputant first and then we'll go to questions for staff. Uh, no questions for the deputant. Ms. McDougall, thank you very much. Um, questions for staff, uh, Councillor Carroll. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering if staff can just clarify exactly what the deputant just suggested. What I'm looking at, I'm, I'm uh, today. I'm using the 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 agenda web portal, so I think I am looking at the most up to date recommendations because it says the senior manager of heritage planning, urban design, and city planning recommends that, and then I see the recommendations. So is that the supplementary uh, latest recommendations? Um, through the chair, uh, thank you. Yes, the, those are the latest recommendations from uh, staff. Okay, okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I have questions. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Um, <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Minna Wong. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't have the benefit of seeing the new report. It's not, I'm, I'm looking on the website, I can't see the, the new report. Um, but maybe you can help me. Maybe staff can help me out. The, there's, there's a difference between what was previously recommended and the most recent report that's now recommended. Can you tell me what the change is? Uh, thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, so the amendments to the report were uh, primarily on uh, recommendations um, to clarify the extent of the designation of the property. Uh, as uh, Cynthia was uh, describing, um, after the Toronto Preservation Board meeting, um, there was an interest in, in determining what the, what the extent of that designation was. And so we clarified it to represent, uh, or to be essentially limited to Block 12, which encompasses uh, the building and some of the landscape around the area. There's also an interest because uh, landscape beyond that area, to primarily to the south and west, uh, is also part of the um, statement of significance. But once we understood that those portions of the existing property now are going to be transferred to the TRCA as well as parks, and then incorporating the extension for the roadway there, um, we're now assured that those are, are don't need designation as they'll be conserved through the review of TRCA and, and parks uh, projects. And then to the rear of the property, given that that's not identified as part of the statement of significance, that didn't need to be incorporated in the designation as well. The initial designation was for the entire 1150 Eglinton Avenue East property. And uh, so we refined it to, to the areas that are actually uh, of interest as identified in the, in the statement of significance. I was, uh, my office was, Toing and throwing with the um, applicant about a lobby piece to the main building. Is that part of, is that being considered in this discussion? That's not being considered in this discussion. That was uh, through the chair added as a, by the Toronto Preservation Board, uh, where they wanted to um, ask for uh, further exploration um, of that lobby space uh, to determine whether there was any that was uh, remaining that hasn't otherwise been altered. And if so, uh, and even if there isn't any, uh, well, if there was any, could it be conserved or incorporated into some interpretive program? Or even if there isn't any, can it be part of an interpretive program? Um, and that's it offers a bit more direction uh, to to the proponent and to staff, um, but that's all also I think would be incorporated within the general direction. Uh, another condition to do a, in the recommendations to an interpretation plan anyway. So as noted uh, in item six a six six a no sorry yeah six a. Six, um, provide an interpretation plan for the heritage property to the satisfaction of the senior manager. Um, so that interpretation plan is part of the approval recommendations anyway. 
by those staff recommendations. Um, but that direction from the Toronto Preservation Board would uh, provide specific direction about the lobbies to, to explore further or not. And do your recommendations conflict in any way with the Preservation Board? Um, no, with the Preservation Board, I think, also added two other conditions, which were largely for staff report backs. Um, on requesting that we report back on cultural heritage landscape designation for the Eglinton Corridor and for a report back on outstanding properties assessed in the Don Mills uh, crossing. So those, for example, because their staff report backs could be incorporated into the recommendations as you see fit. Um, and Again, I, I don't think I see a conflict with the amended uh, 6A6 or 6, yeah, 6A6 that the TPB recommended. There's more direct, again, they, they provide more detail about exploration of the interior lobbies and uh, some, something about the history of IBM within Don Mills. But we'd consider that as part of a, a thorough uh, interpretive plan anyway. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, any any other questions for staff? Any uh, speakers on the item? Um, I'm happy to move the revised. I guess it would be the revised recommendation, the revised report. Yeah, what you're looking at is is the is the most updates. So it would be the revisions plus what was there? Just the revised report, yes, is before us. So I'll move that. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Uh, next uh, timed item. Oh, no, uh, it's a 10. And it's defense exemption 47, Codsel. Um We could do Councillor Carroll's. Uh, she had a... a a new item on parking. Um, now, I guess we put it on the screen because we can't circulate. Yes, thank you. If you want to, do you want to uh, briefly describe what you're doing here? Uh, yes, uh, councillors, this is just a quick parking amendment and, and I'm moving it because it's it's somewhat urgent and, and that's why I'm not waiting for a staff report. But but we did consult with the uh, transportation. Uh, this is simply a matter, I think you've all been in this uh, situation, on, on what is a local artery, Bryan Drive. Uh, there's the little shoppies of Bryan, and uh, they have been deliberately designed with a wraparound uh, parking lot that goes all the way around three rows of shops so that there's lots of room in the parking lot for people making deliveries to pull in and get off of this road. Uh, but um, in, in uh, recent months, uh, a particularly uh, uh, frustrating situation has developed around one of the stores, a convenience store on the corner of it, is now having their deliveries right there um, in, uh, in front of their door, uh, trucks parking right in the middle of the artery. Uh, it, while, it, while it's a main road into a neighborhood, it is not wide enough to have people careen around from the intersection and bamo there's a truck right in the way um i'm i'm taking the step of introducing this as a quick item and making the amendment having consulted with um the uh not just the original complainant but but reaching out to the ratepayers association and they they drafted it and what we got back was a hallelujah yes could you make those uh, trucks park on the actual plaza lot like they're supposed to and so we're uh, we're moving it here as a new item in the hopes that uh, that staff can can order up the signage as, as soon as possible. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Carroll. Um, are there any questions for staff? Uh, any any other speakers on the item? Seem like reasonable parking amendments. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. So, oh, we can't quite go to 10 o'clock. Yes, yeah, so, um, yeah, we'll do the other um, added item, it, which is mine. 
Um, and it's, it's to correct. Um, um, there was a, a small error that we have to correct from, from last uh, meeting. So um, if we could just put it on the, on the screen or circulate it somehow. So I think it, what happened was, I think the name of a street was left out in a traffic calming um, package. So we want to, we want to um, delete and add. We want to delete and, and, and um, adopt the following. It's at the bottom of the page. Okay, so we need, we need a motion to reopen. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? And that that is carried. And uh, drop the item. All those in favor? Opposed. That is carried. So I think we can go to ten o'clock. Um, item six: request for fence exemption, uh, rear yard forty-seven Codsell. I do have a deputant uh, listed, uh, Victoria Suchaverchova. And I hope I've come close in the pronunciation. Is Victoria, are you on the line? She's there? Okay, great. Victoria, thanks for joining us. You have five minutes. Victoria? Are you the homeowner at 47 Console or a neighbor? Hmm. Hi, Victoria. Your audio is connected and you're unmuted. Please say something so that we can be sure we can hear you. Victoria? All right, um, we, we are having some connection problems with our deputants, so we'll hold, um, we'll hold item six down. It's actually in my area. So we'll hold that down and we'll come back to it uh, <coughs> a little later. Um, item seven, also a timed item, uh, 16 Lee Croft Crescent. We do have a deputant uh, on the item. It is uh, Ian Haig. Uh, Mr. Haig, are you on the line? Mr. Haig? Hello? Uh, Mr. Haig? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. You have five minutes. So, I am the homeowner at 52 Lee Croft. The fence in question is at uh, 16 Lee Croft, which is their backyard, but it's my side yard. They have a corner lot. The side yard, my side yard, it, the fence extends actually in front of my house, about 16 feet or so in front of my house, so it's very visible. It's also very high. They, I think they're, they're about 20% greater than the bylaw allows. So in my case, at the worst case, at the street point, it's instead of being two meters high, it's 2.7 meters high. And the fence is a solid material. It's not lattice or anything like that. It's a solid material. And of course it creates issues of blocking the light, et cetera. And so I would like the, the, the request to be denied and I'd like to see them provide a, a fence that uh, conforms with the bylaw. All right, um, thank you very much. Uh, any, any questions for the deputant? 
No. No. Um, any questions for staff? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Councillor Carroll? We can't, you're on mute, Councillor Carroll. I, I, I'm forever doing that, uh, muting myself instead of unmuting myself. <laughs> uh, so the, the fence, uh, from the report, we can see this, we're talking about a fence that's fully constructed and uh, uh, so this is going back in time that the, the uh, toppings and finials are on there. Um, if we uh, if we ask that the uh, that they bring the fence into compliance, um, is it staff's opinion that structurally they can simply shorten the fence that's there? They don't have to tear it out and start over again. Uh, staff to the floor. Uh, yes, I'm here. Good oh. morning. Oh, uh, good yeah. Mr. Chair. Good morning. Yeah, is it a reasonable request uh, uh, given that if you if you visit the structure of this fence, is it a reasonable request to ask, ask them to bring the current fence into compliance? We wouldn't be asking them, we, it wouldn't be necessary to tear the whole thing out. They could leave it moored as it is and simply shorten it. Is that is that a reasonable request? That is correct. I would think it okay. is. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to check that. Thank you, Madam, Madam, uh, uh, Madam MLS person. <laughs> it's Elena San Giuliano. Okay, there we go. Uh, any other questions for staff? Um, I, I just have one. The, the deputy did seem to describe a fence coming onto his property and blocking his sight lines. Is that, is that what you discovered when you inspected the property? Sorry, um, I'm unfortunately the uh, the report would have been written by one of the supervisors, so I didn't actually attend the property. However, from the uh, report and the photos provided, I'm only be, I'm only able to view it from the actual applicant's uh, property, and I cannot see what the neighboring property looks like from this angle. So I cannot provide you a, a, an exact. Uh, response. I would have imagined, though, that the officer, or sorry, the supervisor, when conducting his inspection, would have ensured that there were no sight line. No sight line issues or sight lines were impaired? Correct. No sight line issues. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions for staff? Okay. So. This is Councillor Robinson's uh, item. It's it's a bit tricky um, because she's not here. The the direction that we have is that it's up to us. Um, so, um, any speakers uh, on the item, Councillor Carroll? I'll speak. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, further to the questions that I asked of staff, I'd be willing to remove the the first option that that. Uh, staff recommend that the uh, that the owner be required to bring the fence into compliance. Uh, I realize that there there is some expense involved in that, but we're not asking them to destroy a whole fence and start over again. They really can. It's a wood constructed fence. They can simply bring it to the height that uh, the bylaw requires, and uh, uh, and 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 keep all the moorings in place. And so I'll move that that first recommendation that the fence be brought into compliance no you're aren't you uh, recommending uh, granting the application with conditions no I'm not option one is refused Refuse to grant the application you're you're moving Sorry, I'm trying to get back to I'm just moving back to the uh, to the item I'm flipping through on the portal so let me go back to the original because it gives us two options right yeah, so then, number one is refusal is yeah, that's what I'm moving. Refuse to grant the application for an exemption permit, which 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 gives effect to uh, requiring them to bring that fence into compliance. I'll speak to that. Okay, um, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong. Yeah, I'm going to um, agree with Councillor Carroll on this one. Um, corner properties always create more of a problem 
um, then properties that aren't on corners. Yeah. Um, I'm usually a little bit more flexible on fences, fences between homes and in the back of homes that aren't don't show a lot of impact. In this circumstance, it's a corner property and there is an impact. So I think we actually have to be a little bit more um, respectful of the bylaw and and uh, and adopt uh, recommendation number one. Okay. Any other speakers on the item? Um, Councilor Carroll has uh, moved uh, item number one, which is uh, a refusal. There it is on the screen. Uh, all those in all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. I think I didn't see everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor? Just do that voting. Okay. Okay. There we go. That is opposed. That is carried. Do we have the deputant? Okay, so we're going to go back uh, when an item we held down because we were having trouble uh, connecting with a deputant. Uh, it is item 647 Codzel. Uh, the deputant is Victoria, I get a second chance in her last name, Sucha Vercervo. Va? Hello, can you hear me? Victoria. Victoria. Anyway, Victoria, thank you. Oops. Uh, Sorry. Oh, no, <laughs> sorry. Uh, that's quite the chime. Um, Victoria, just for clarification, are you, are you the owner at 47 Codzel? Hey, hello, can you hear me? This time? Are you the neighbor? Or? No, no, sorry. Uh, excuse me. Can you hear me? Hi, Victoria. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. I just wasn't sure. Uh, I'm the owner of uh, 47 Cotel Avenue. Okay, so you're the owner. Okay, we just wanted context. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. You have mm -hmm. five minutes. Uh, thank you. So, uh, basically, I'm the owner of the property on 47 Cotel Avenue, and our property is located on the corner uh, site. So, uh, due to the basement flood prevention program that there is construction in our area, uh, the city basically requested us uh, to approve removal of huge cedar um, hedge on the site of the uh, property. And this hedge was removed. So now we apply for the extension. Uh, we, need, we need to replace the fence and we apply for the extension. And the reason for this one is basically that the, the cage, cedar cage that was removed, it provides for us uh, some kind of full privacy and security to our house. And now when it's removed, all our lands become extremely open for the people observation. We have two young children that consist, consistently play in the back, uh, backyard. So now people can see them, speak to them, uh, in addition to this one, we have a very big solarium that's located in our backyard attached with the house. And we spend a lot of time, time in this solarium, so now everything is also open for the people observation. And in addition to all of this, we have already approved an engineering plan for the house renovation. And a part of this renovation, we plan to open our patio door. It means that it's going to be some kind of open concept, and even ha even the part of the house is going to be open to the people. And for this, by the way, for this uh, renovation, we have already permit that we received from the city. The work was postponed just because of uh, the current situation with uh, COVID-19. So. One additional information, our house is located on some, some kind of small hill elevation, and this is why two meters, two meters fence will be, not, not, will be not enough to provide to us with the required privacy, since the corner side of the backyard is much lower than the part where the house is located. Uh, so this is why basically all this situation forced us to apply for the fence extension. 
and say, I hope that it will be approved by the city. And finally, I just want to say that uh, I know that we are asking for some special approval, but you would see how beautiful and cozy was our backyard and uh, what we actually lost because of this uh, seed of removal bomb. So basically, it even impacts the value of our property. So at least please help us to bring back a minimum of privacy and safety. Uh, thank you. And please let me know if you have some questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, any questions for the deputant? Um, I, I have a couple. Um, I'm just, I guess I'm looking at a, a couple of photographs here. This is, um, these are cedars. These are, um, Cedar trees, these yes. are large cedars, which we're considering a fence. This is not a wood fence. Um, Whatever you see on the photos, everything was removed. Yeah, I have questions for staff about that, uh, Mr. Speaker, because the deputant's uh, speech doesn't really match up with the report. The report's about the hedge. We don't have details on the fence she's applying for. Yeah, I don't. I don't see. The hedge a, is gone. I don't see a fence in any of these hedge in any of these pictures. I see a massive hedge. Yeah, I'll have um, questions of staff so, about that. Yeah, we're a little confused. Um, okay. Um, So you're saying these hedges are gone or trimmed? Yeah, the hedge was removed. But yes, the hedge already was removed, and city is right now still continue to do work on the corner of our house. They should move probably next week, and then we should start with replacement of the fence. So once we are doing replacement of the fence, we just want to make this more higher, more tall than normal. Okay. All right. It seems reasonable. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. Any any other questions for the deputant? No. Uh, let's go. Questions for staff, Councillor Carroll. Thank you. So um, maybe staff can help us uh, understand what we have before us is uh, what looks like a request for exemption to leave the hedges tall. We don't have the exact numbers of, of what is the fence they're applying for and what would the variance be? So is it extreme? Uh, uh, do you have drawings? Um, should we be deferring this and getting those things? Yes, good morning. Uh, through you, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize because I won't be able to shed too much light on this particular report. Unfortunately, it's a portion of uh, North York that is looked after by, by our West District Office. And I was under the understanding that one of my colleagues would be here to speak to it. Unfortunately, they are not. And this is the first I'm seeing of this report, but um, Councillor, I would agree with you. The, cat, the report is specific to the hedge. So I guess my question is, yeah. the applicant would have had to have submitted their fence exemption application specific to the hedge. If that has changed and or the hedge was removed, then I would think that the applicant would have contacted the uh, supervisor who attended and wrote the report to advise that the hedge has been removed. And if they're now requesting an exemption to a fence, we would have to look at that proposal to see if it even meets the requirements of this of the bylaw and is a fence exemption even needed? So um, in order to move that process along, um, the, the, if, we were to, if we were to say on this report, which is about the hedge, refuse to grant the application for an exemption permit, uh, we're fine doing that because the, the, uh, the uh, uh, applicant appears to have already complied with that. She has removed that hedge. But she needs to come back if she wants an exemption from the fence bylaw to build a structural fence rather than a hedge. We need to see that application. Am I am I am I right in outlining that? Yes, Councillor, you are 100% correct. We would have to see it as well. Is there an existing fence? Is there a proposal for a higher fence? We would have to review the fence itself and not the hedge which the report was written for. Okay, okay. Uh, I think I have a course of action. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you can put me down to speak, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Carroll. 
Uh, any other questions for staff? I guess I have a, a couple. Um, so, so the report, if, if we can, if we can take it at face value that these hedges are now gone or, or tr trimmed down to a foot or whatever they are, that the item before us is, is no longer applies, and that the owner has to apply for a new building permit for the fence with with an, a request for an exemption attached. That's a that's a completely different item. Right. Okay, so um, if, we, if we do move or seat on this, this. Okay, so the, the suggestion from clerk is to move it back, but Councillor Carroll wants to speak. Um, so. I, it, it, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, this is, this is a, a bit of an odd situation where, uh, where the item before us really is, is no longer current and no longer applies. Um, and there's been some mis some disconnect um, somewhere along the line between what the owner wants to do in the future and and what's been done in the past. Um, so we can go to we can go to speakers. Um, Councillor Carroll. So Mr. Mr. Chair, what what I'm going to suggest and and move in fact is that we move the the refuse to grant the exemption because the this application this exemption for the hedge is still floating around in the system. And it's great. It's really great that the owner has complied already uh, by removing it. But we sort of closed the books on that hedge growing back and, and, and becoming unruly again by simply putting on the books. We refuse to allow that that, that hedge be that tall. Uh, that that uh, puts to bed the exemption applied for over the hedge. Um, what we are very clearly not doing today is is granting any kind of an exemption for a structural uh, uh, fence. That will have to come back to us at a later date. But if you really want to close that exemption permit that's been applied for at the counter, we should just, we should just adopt one, refuse to grant the exemption. And happily, the owner has already complied. What? Um, okay. So Councillor Carroll has, has moved refu ref refusal, which is option option number one on, on the staff report, um, where there's an application for an exemption for something that doesn't exist, I guess. I worry that this will go back in the system and see, see a council's direction as a refusal, and then it'll all get messed up with what they're doing in the future and so forth. Why don't we clean this whole thing I, up? And I, well, okay. I, I, if I could, I, I have to take a personal exception. We're, we're now, if we're going to debate it, let's debate it. But are, 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 are you putting this to a vote or are you now speaking to the item? I'm, I'm going to speak to the item. I, I'm, okay. I like, okay. I like, right. I, like sure. I like this to go back to staff to clean it up and bring it back to us when it's, when it's applicable and current and reflects the reality on the ground. So, um, I'm going to move referral and have staff figure this thing out. I'm also going to take a, a visit to 47 Codsell and, and see, see what's there now and, uh, and see what they're planning in the future. Um, so I'll, I'll move referral back to staff. Um, and uh, if someone else uh, wants to move something else, they, they're, they're welcome to do so. Uh, so I, I have already moved something else. Yes. Yeah, so um, we'll be voting on one. Yeah. Yeah. So um, referral takes precedent. Yeah. So we'll vote on referral first because uh, referral takes precedent. Um, let's let's send this back to are staff. Are there any are there any speakers to referring? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Vice Chair uh, Carroll, for that. Uh, call out. Yes. I'm just, no, I'm just asking. <laughs> yeah. I'm asking procedurally. Can people speak to the referral motion? They they could if they want. Put me down to speak, please. Okay, Councillor Carroll. Um, feel free to speak to uh, the referral motion. So, with respect, um, I would submit that referring simply keeps afloat something we don't need anymore. Uh, refusing just puts to bed an application for offence. 
for a hedge, I should say, that no longer exists. And that's the fastest way to put that to bed for staff. So they have to they have nothing more to do on the fence. We simply refused it. And if they, the resident has told the truth that she's taken it down, then no one has any further action to take. Why waste time, time and money taking any further action? What we need now is for the resident to simply come back with an application to build a fence. Um, referral, I would submit, is a bit of a waste of staff's time. Um, and so I won't be able to support it. Thank you. I guess I've spoken to it already. Anyone else wants to speak to referral? All right. Okay, uh, all those in favor of referral, let's let staff clean this up. Um, opposed? Uh, all those um, who support uh, refusing the application? People are voting twice. Um, well, I, okay, that carries. <laughs> I saw someone's hand went up twice. There, there, with respect, Mr. Chair, the refusal Chair, carries. Sorry, on a point of so, order, uh, Councillor Carroll, the order, Mr. Chair. On a point of order, Mr. Chair, you never told us the outcome of the, the, the referral motion after we put up our hands to oppose. So no one was voting twice. They were voting on the next item. Could you perhaps tell us what the outcome was of the first motion we voted on? Ref and then yes, tell us what yes, the, for the, clarity the outcome sake, was in the next motion. I, I thought you could see it on the screen. I do apologize. Referral did not carry. Well, I, I just, Refusal. My, my personal Ref my <laughs> point of order is on saying we voted twice. I don't think anyone voted twice. <laughs> okay. Well, look, I'm looking at a, a screen with multiple images. So. Um, uh, maybe I'm seeing as are we all. Maybe maybe I'm seeing double. Anyway, refusal refusal carried. I hope this doesn't come back as a confusing mess. Um, so that item is done. Uh, no sign. So I have uh, 167 uh, fence exemption. Sorry, Councillor Robinson, that is done. So item eight, also Councillor Robinson. Uh, fence exemption, uh, any questions for staff? Uh, yes, please. Yes, I, I believe there Carol. are speakers to this item. Are there, are, there, are there are speakers to item number eight? Uh, do we have them on the line? Yeah. So we do have two deputants, um, Vladimir Gaverlin. Yeah, I'm here. Do you hear me well? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very okay. much. My son-in-law, my son-in-law, Cesar Arellano, would represent myself. Good, good morning. Hi, I'm, I'm going to read some remarks that were prepared by Vladimir and Galina. Uh, can, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, just for clarity, are you the, the homeowner of uh, Winless? So, to, to so Vladimir Gaverman and Galina are the homeowners at 211 Wanless. I'm their son-in-law, and I'm simply reading some remarks that they've prepared. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. You have five minutes. Okay. On the east side of our house at 211 Wanless Avenue in Toronto, our neighbor's house has a window that faces directly onto our patio and the rear of our house. The window is only 30 centimeters or one foot away from our property line. It is five by five feet in size. And as you can see from the site photo attached to our application, it allows the neighboring house to have an unobstructed view from their living room. Our neighbors can clearly see our entire kitchen, half of our dining room, our patio, garage, and half of our backyard. 
In addition to this, the window can be opened right onto our property due to its close proximity to the property line. We were informed by North York Building Customer Service staff that the addition to 215 Longless, where the window is situated, was built without a permit. So, in summary, the situation we are facing is that a window that was added to our neighbor's house, which does not respect city bylaw, is compromising our family's privacy, and we are worried that this undesirable situation could have a negative effect on our property value. We request a fence exemption to solve this problem. This would be a fence that is 2.9 meters high by 2.5 meters wide. Thank you for considering this matter from our perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions for the deputant? Councilor Carroll? Yes. Yes, I'm wondering if you can help us to understand the picture. Because uh, from your comments, I understand the window to be the issue, but the fence that is 2.9 meters where it should be two ends just before that window. So how are we ameliorating the window situation? <laughs> Because um, it's Galina, Gavrilina, uh, one of the property owners. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we have to just expand a little bit in deep our fence and make it higher. That's all. We're going to install a new pole and uh, going to make a fence 2.9 meter high. 2.9 meter high and 2.5 meters long. long. Just to block this window, that's all. So it does is 2.9 meters the height of the, the post that I'm looking at? And you, no, you'd be no. installing it? So you're looking at it's shorter. Most is slightly shorter than 2.9, but we can uh, make it work. 2.9 would be workable after. So it's just a matter of building what we require. So I, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry to belabor this, but I'm, I'm not clear. What we're looking at, at, and people watching the meeting, unless they're on the online portal, aren't looking at it. But the picture we're looking at shows a fence that's not yet complete and a, a post that goes up. It stops just sort of the window. Are you suggesting building another section of fence and it will be the height of that post that's sticking up or even taller than that? Than that. So that is, I think what they mentioned is that the post is not 2.9 meters high. The extension would be 2.9 meters high. Uh, okay, but how meters. tall is, so how tall is the post? I'm sorry, the word cut out, so I don't know if she said smaller than that or larger than that. It's, uh, it's a problem, I don't know, 2.3, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, 2.
Tay Rayak, you've been granted access to audio. If you could please connect your audio so you can speak to the meeting. Mr. Ryak? You want to hold the item down? Okay. Um, Councillors, we're going to hold, hold item 8 down. There is a deputant on it, another deputant on it, but we are having trouble uh, connecting. So we're going to try that again uh, in a few minutes. Um, I believe we're on item nine. Thirty-four Whitaker Crescent application to remove a private tree. I don't have any deputants. Uh, on, yes. On the, just one sec. I don't have any deputants uh, listed on the item. Are there any questions for staff? Any speakers? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. So you don't have a, uh, the the applicant here to speak because she has asked for one more month deferral. She uh, is uh, working with another specialist that she she wants to have information from at that time. I don't know if my staff submitted the deferral motion in writing, but the the request is to defer this for one more month uh, to the next meeting. Okay, fair Although enough. Although I think that means two months. I don't think we have an August meeting. No, um, but if we miss each other, we can always come back um, for, for August. <laughs> um, Anything for but, you. But the staff do have the, <laughs> the deferral motion is on the screen. Um, all those in oh, favor? Fantastic. Opposed? Uh, that is uh, carried. Item number 10 is application to remove a private tree, 522 Woburn Avenue. And I do not have any speakers on the item. Uh, questions for staff? Councillor Cole, I believe this is yes. in your ward. Yeah, I just want to speak. Sure. Any other councillors for questions for staff? No? Okay, speakers, Councillor Cole. Yes, uh, this is uh, an item that's been before us, been before us uh, last month, and uh, what we're doing is um, we're, we've got a number of arborist reports. I've talked to city staff uh, about this uh, plight of this tree, which uh, is uh, in a very precarious state given there's been a buildup of a deck and uh, swimming area and everything in the, around it uh, has been brutally pruned, et cetera, et cetera. Staff recommends the best thing we can do here is refer to urban forestry's uh, compliance and enforcement branch and let them deal with it uh, just because of the particular situation the tree is in and that's what staff has recommended that I do and uh, that's what I'm uh, proposing that we do refer to uh, back to compliance and enforcement mm -hmm. branch of urban forestry. forestry. Okay, uh, we're referring it back, I, to, can, back to staff. Yeah, um, can I ask a question of the mover? Sure. Uh, so I, referring it back to staff uh, is, uh, is fine with me because maybe there's an update to the condition, but is, is it your understanding from staff that if they decide to uh, it, you know, if the condition is such that they're going to allow it to be removed, will they will they have the jurisdiction to just take care of replacement trees and such? Well, again, uh, it is very, uh, uh, let's say, difficult to ascertain uh, whether uh, there is uh, the ability to put replacement trees on site. Uh, it's just that staff feels that uh, they want to take another look at the tree because there may have been some damage uh, done to the tree and this uh, brutal pruning that's taking place, et cetera. So that's why I think by referring it back to them uh, and then they, can, they thought that would be the best way to proceed because this is getting quite okay. complicated. 
Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other um, questions for the mover? Any other speakers? No. Uh, okay. We have a motion to refer this back. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item number 11, um, application to remove a city-owned tree, um, 108 um, Aspenwood. Uh, don't have any deputants on this item. Uh, questions for staff? Councillor Carroll? Uh, uh, just to uh, no, just to speak. Okay, any other councillors for questions for staff? No? Um, speakers, Councillor Carroll? Uh, yeah, I can move the staff recommendation, which is to deny the request to, to remove this city-owned tree. Uh, it's unfortunate that the, the photographs don't, uh, don't show it, but uh, we've been out to visit the site, and uh, uh, this is a rather large renovation, and uh, from the plans, the, the driveway is shifting to the other side of the lot, but, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's my view that, that if that driveway is uh, um, within appropriate compliance with, with driveway widths in the area, that according to our own DIPS policy, that there's still room for this tree to survive no matter where the driveway is. So I'm going to move the staff recommendation. Okay, staff recommendations moved. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Item number 12, application to remove a private tree, 231 Castlefield Avenue. Questions for staff? Yes, I, I have questions for staff. I don't have speakers on this item. No. Okay, questions for staff, Councillor Cole. Yes, uh, if I could ask uh, staff, the, uh, what is the condition of this black walnut tree? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay. Uh, the, the tree is abundantly healthy, so it's very healthy. And uh, I guess one of the issues here relates to the uh, falling uh, walnuts. Uh, when a, a walnut falls on a black walnut tree, uh, is there a possible uh, uh, situation where there might be an allergic reaction to the walnut falling on you know, the ground? Or does the walnut have to crack open? Not this, not this again. Yeah. Yes, it's walnut, yeah. it's, uh, it's walnut gates all over again. There's it's no the Mark Grimes Memorial debate. Yeah. Um. Do we have so someone from Toronto Public Health available? Um, Councilman Wong could recount that report. Yeah, I could. So this is a these these we delve into medical issues with these walnuts. Anyway, if staff want to take a crack at it, pardon the pun, um, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, through, you, through you, Mr. Chair, um, there's no simple answer, unfortunately. Uh, walnuts uh, do fall uh, through the summer months and into the fall. Uh, they may fall when the fruit is ripe, in which case a, um, a large, uh, you know, golf ball-sized fruit comes down and it's intact. Uh, they may also be um, chewed up by squirrels in the tree and, and portions of the husk in the, in the interior nut may also fall. Um, and nuts on the ground uh, can also be, um, you know, stepped on or, or broken open. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that's as much as I, I would say about the, the walnuts themselves. I, I don't really want to speak to the medical issues and, and allergies and risks and, and what portions of the, of the nut are, are dangerous, et cetera. Okay, I'll, let's get back to uh, your field of expertise, uh, our urban uh, <laughs> forest. Uh, what uh, are the strengths of our uh, much maligned black walnuts in uh, our urban canopy? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, it's a, it's a great question. Um, walnuts are um, well known for their hardwood characteristics. Um, 
not so much of an issue in the urban forest. They are phenomenal shade trees. They're uh, a species. They're very tolerant of the environmental conditions in, in our region. Uh, they're very robust through, through winter time. They produce large uh, open canopies as, as shade trees, um, fast growing, um, large maturing. Um, urban forestry uh, has a mandate to pursue a planting of large maturing native shade trees uh, when we review applications. And uh, black walnut is, a, is an excellent example of, of that catchphrase. It's a large maturing native shade tree. And how uh, tall and what's the diameter uh, of the uh, trunk, et cetera, of this tree? I have to refer back to the report, which uh, <clears throat> won't take me long at all. I know, in the, the photo, it looks like about 20, 30 feet at least. Um, the tree is certainly larger than the house itself. Um, the walnut tree in question uh, is 50 centimeters in diameter. So I would I would classify it as as middle aged. Uh, what's middle aged for a tree? I just uh, interest. A healthy walnut in uh, optimal growing conditions could could reach 100 to 150 years uh, and and more easily. Wow. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cole. Any other questions for for staff on this item? No speakers. Councillor Cole, what would you like to do with this item? Yes, as uh, we uh, recall, uh, Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong had a similar type request dealing with a request by homeowner to uh, uh, eliminate uh, a, a black walnut tree uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which uh, being that there was falling. Uh, Walnuts that were possibly uh, uh, causing uh, harm to uh, people living in the home, uh, and uh, and I think at that time we refused the request because I think we later found out that the I think the residents were uh, there was a family uh, and the children uh, we were told that there were children but the children were adult children and whether they live there or not. So anyways, I think we finally decided after much legal and health input uh, to protect the tree and deny the request to cut it down. But these are not easy uh, things to deal with because you can see the sensitivity by the homeowner uh, worrying about the potential allergic uh, response to uh, any kind of nut tree, etc. So it is not an easy decision to make uh, uh, in dealing with this uh, request here. But, uh, you know, in talking to staff and uh, examining this uh, state of this tree, uh, it is a, a very vibrant, healthy tree that, you know, as staff said, it could last up to 125, 150 years. Um, it does provide uh, shade, uh, and it is a native, uh, you know, variety of trees. So, uh, very robust. Uh, uh, what I'm concerned about, and I, I said we've witnessed this here, is that uh, once we make a decision to um, uh, acquiesce to a, a request by a homeowner to chop down a healthy, vibrant uh, shade tree like this walnut tree, uh, where does it stop? Uh, there are uh, concerns, obviously, the homeowner has here, and. Uh, and it's not easy to make uh, these uh, uh, Solomon-like decisions about the state of trees on a weekly or every time we meet here. But uh, I would think uh, in terms of protecting the future uh, of the canopy and trees in Toronto, uh, uh, you know, I, th I would uh, recommend we, we deny the request to... Uh, uh, eliminate the tree uh, by the homeowner and uh, refuse the request. Uh, and it's, again, it's not an easy one, and I, I know there are sensitivities here uh, that have been considered, uh, but I, I would uh, uh, support uh, the keeping of the tree uh, because of its uh, healthy state, etc. And because I don't want to set off a chain reaction precedent here of everybody that has a 
uh, walnut tr tree um, in the city, a black walnut tree all of a sudden feels that uh, they can um, request that they be eliminated because of the situation with the falling uh, walnuts, uh, uh, in this case, the black walnuts. So, uh, and this has been a, an age old uh, problem. I, I can remember in my days in city of York council, I used to get into regular battles with uh, uh, some of my fellow, fellow countrymen from Italy who uh, wanted to chop down every tree that didn't have uh, fruit to bear. And subsequently, uh, we lost uh, thousands of uh, trees uh, in the St. Clair West area. Uh, and then we, the bylaw came into effect. We protect. I remember Charles Katcha was uh, for our Ministry of Environment, who uh, represented the area too, was just appalled by the fact it was almost like clear cutting done in the middle of the city. And we lost so many incredible trees. So that's the history of it. It's, uh, you know, because. Homeowners would get uh, doctor's notes saying they were allergic to falling leaves, uh, you know, the sewer argument. This, but So it is not easy for councillors, I think, to make these decisions. They would like to listen to the homeowners, but on the other hand, we, we've got a more macro uh, issue to deal with, and that is the health of our uh, city's air and uh, our urban uh, canopy and uh, just maintaining our trees uh, that are healthy. So I, I would uh, uh, support the uh, denial of the request to uh, remove the tree at this address. All righty, thank you, Councillor Cole. Any other speakers on this item? Uh, Councillor Cole is moving the staff recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. We had previous held down uh, item number eight. Uh, because we were having trouble reaching a deputant. We now have that deputant on the line. So we'll go back to number eight, a request for fence exemption, 211 Wellness Avenue. Uh, Ty Ruak is on the line. David Ruak. Ruak? Ruak? Yes, sir. Yeah, oh, uh, great. Hey, Ruak. Thank you. Good. Thank you for joining us. You're with Urban Advisors. Just for context, um, are you re representing a homeowner or are you an owner yourself? Correct, sir. I'm representing the owners of 215 Wanless Avenue, which is the immediate neighbor uh, to the west. Okay, the thank east, you. Sir. Okay, thank you for joining us. Uh, you have five minutes. Sure, uh, sir. There, I believe, have been submissions made by the owners of property of uh, the owners of the property at 215 Wanless Avenue in the form of pictures and also letters and opposition letters that have been gained, obtained by the neighbors in the area. Uh, what you find is, is that in this particular neighborhood, that this is a very tightly knit neighborhood and in the pictures uh, that have been submitted are pictures of homes within a one block radius that shows windows uh, on first stories or on second stories that overlook onto the rear yards of the properties. This is something that's something that's normal and typical that's found in the area. It's very tightly knit. And what you do find is that if there is any fencing that's found in the area, it's typically maintained within the six foot height requirements. There, is, there isn't any fencing that is above that uh, requirement. The resulting uh, fence that would be, uh, uh, that's being proposed on this particular site of 211 will result in the entire window uh, being covered. And I do believe there was a, a, a rendering that was submitted with the, uh, uh, with the opposition letter that was submitted to the community council, which shows that that window will be completely blocked uh, from the, uh, from the, uh, from the rear road and obstructing any form of light that would enter into the, the pro, into the home. This is a, if the properties were separated somewhat of a distance, um, that wouldn't be so much of a concern. However, as indicated earlier, this is a very tightly knit neighborhood. And as you can see in one of the pictures, the gap between the, uh, the houses between 211 and 215 is very minor. Uh, it's a, only a few inches. It's probably less than a foot. And to place a nine foot, uh, nine foot plus fence uh, in front of a window with that kind of a limited separation distance would create something that's a, uh, something that's that'd be intrusive and it'd be something that's uncharacteristic of the neighborhood as well. 
Um, I do believe that you have received the 16 letters of opposition that have been provided by the neighbors in the area. And quite frankly, my, the owners of the property of, my, of, of 215 did reach out to the owners of 211 on uh, multiple occasions and also left a letter in their mailbox indicating, listen, um, we would like to have a conversation to see if there's some sort of a mitigation that we could come to, a resolution. Um, there was a suggestion of providing some sort of coverings on the window so there isn't any privacy issues listen, looking into the rear of 211. That response was not provided uh, to, the, to my clients. And um, my clients are more than willing to work with uh, with the owners of 211 to come to some sort of re resolution that is mutually satisfactory to both parties. Uh, but placing a nine foot plus fence right in front of a window at a gap distance of probably a couple of inches is something that is uh, something that my clients will not be able to accept. Uh, and once again, it's completely out of character uh, within this very tightly knit neighborhood. And having windows peer into rear yards or into adjacent properties is something that's characteristic because of the tight nature of the area and um, we would recommend that the application be refused okay thank you very much uh, any questions for the deputant uh, no uh, thank you very much uh, so uh, questions for staff uh, Councillor Carroll. Um, yes, it's taken me it, uh, it's taken me some time to figure out the the attachment that the uh, the resident is talking about. I actually couldn't find it on the website on the portal, the new paperless portal that we're supposed to be using. I do have the email from Anthony Green um, uh, from I believe two fifteen Wanless and uh, the, uh, their rendering of what the fence would look like once constructed as, as, as applied for under exemption. My question is why don't we have um, a plan, a drawing, or, or any kind of, of, of rendering like that um, with the application and included in this report? All we have is a photograph that really doesn't show us at all that this fence is just going to obliterate this window. Is there anything that they said that you posted? That there was some concern from Through you, Mr. Chair. So she didn't know what to I don't believe that a uh, sketch is required. I would agree with you that it would probably have been a good idea to have one. However, there is not one required with the application process. Uh, it just the proposal itself on what they plan on doing. So is it clear in the proposal okay. itself Alrighty. that they intend with this fence to go right past the line of the, the, the structure and, and build it right across that window? Was that, was that clear at the counter? Uh, yeah, one second. Sorry, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. The actual uh, proposed construction speaks to not only the height, uh, 2.9 meters, 9.5 feet in height, but approximately 8.2 feet, feet of span, 2.5 meters along the property line. So what, uh, translate that for me. Does that, is that clear to you that they're, they're going right, right across this window? That they, were, that they were going to build more sections of fence? 17. That was my interpretation, yes. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question, Mr. Chair, of, um, of clerks. Uh, uh, is it possible, what I can see on the portal, is it possible, can we, can we make sure that the councillors have that picture? And if not, is it possible for us to Project it now onto the screen as you would a motion. That all members are able to view this communication via the portal. Yeah, ev everyone should see it, Councillor Carroll. I don't. All members can view all yeah, all all members should I... be able to see what you're referring to. In in the portal. Oh, okay. In the portal. I just wanted to be sure because I a councillor mentioned earlier that they were following on the website, not the portal, and I couldn't get to it on the website. Are people? Do people see the artist's rendition of proposed fence? We do not. 
post. Well, um, we do not post on the public communications with either written consent. Um, so if we did not have. So there, there are uh, there are some privacy issues where um, some had communicated with the city and asked that their uh, communication be kept confidential for the eyes of, of counselors only. So, but the one that I am looking, what I'm asking is the one that I am looking at on the portal, which pretty clearly it is from a, a gentleman by the name of Anthony Green, owner of the home at 215 Wanless, and he seems to have had no problem with it being posted to the portal. Is it possible to, to ensure, as the chair, as the clerk, could someone ensure that my colleagues can see the illustration that I'm looking at? Is that possible? <laughs> is this it? Could we canvas them? Could we Councilor ask Carroll, them is this it? it? Is this it? Is this it? Is this it? Is this what you're referring to? I don't see anything on the screen right now. Are you projecting something onto the screen for me now? Okay, we're, uh, Councillor Carroll, we're going to display the photo we think you're referring to. Oh, here we go. Yes, oh. yes. Oh my gosh. Is that Okay. Thank you. Uh so is it staff's is it staff's interpretation of the actual exemption permit that this is roughly uh what 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 would be constructed? This is, you know, a neighbor who is against the application uh providing this rendering. So I don't, you know, maybe he's gone over the top. Is it staff's uh uh opinion that this is pretty close to what is being applied for? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, I would agree that that is pretty close to what is being applied for. Thank you. Those are my questions, Mr. Chair. I had a question of staff, Councillor Cole. Yeah, Councillor Cole, questions for staff. Am I correct that uh, the uh, addition with the windows, um, the, the, I thought I heard uh, that it was built without a building permit. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, I would not be able to respond to that. That would be a Toronto building question. I would suspect that the um, made that uh, comment and maybe have contacted Toronto buildings. I am not aware. Yeah. We would have to go back and look at the building permit to and the drawings that were approved to ensure that there was a window there and it was approved according to plans or it was put in afterwards. Yeah. And, and the building permit is not really before us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cool. Uh, any other questions for staff? <clears throat> no. Okay. Um, just uh, for for clarity's sake, uh, this is Councillor Robinson's uh, item. Um, she has uh, recommended a ref refusal, so recommendation number one. So if the, uh, if the vice chair is in agreement, um, she can take on uh, moving the, re um, the staff recommendation to refuse. You're, you're welcome to move it yourself, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I, I'd be happy to do it. I, I just wanted to give you uh, so, some extra duties there. Um, but I'd be happy to, I'd be happy I'd to be move happy it. To. Yeah, okay. So on behalf of Jay, I'd be happy to do it. <laughs> okay, uh, that's great then. So, um, uh, so we're moving, we're moving recommendation number one uh, is uh, refusal. And uh, all those in favor? <clears throat> and I don't think anyone's opposed. Okay, thank you very much. Right. So we're at um, my item um, one forty three uh, Plues uh, Plues Road. 
Uh, any questions for staff? We have a deputy. Oh, I'm sorry. Item? Yeah, so do we have um, Michael Rubino, Rubino on, the, on the line? Hello? Yes, Mr. Rubino? Good morning, counselors. Good morning, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you have Can five you minutes. Hear? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm the uh, homeowner of 143 Blues Road, Corrino. Um, you, I uh, submitted a photo. I don't know if you guys can see it. Just want to make sure you can see the photo first and foremost. So we can have a, a basis of what we're discussing. Um, would that be in the portals? Can everyone see the photo? Yeah, uh, counselors, um, in order to see this photo, you'd have to go to your portals. Uh, would you like to proceed? Let me know when you guys can see this. Yeah, Mr. Rubino. But while you're looking for that, I just want to uh, continue forward here. Um, under the, uh, yeah. So under the report for action, uh, I just want to first and foremost talk about the comments with regards to myself preferring the driveway location. It's kind of misleading because I didn't actually prefer that driveway location. It was actually the only location. I'm at the corner of Garrett and Flues. Um, of course, it's the design so that they're detached garage garage will be facing Garrett slightly I'm on a corner I proposed that shut it down since I couldn't because of a stop location on the southwest east side of the box so then I said okay if I can't go there where am I forced to go they said you have to go to the fair lot I asked requested stone certificates with planning Deborah Vita everyone and they I asked if I can go on the northeast side where the existing driveway originally was prior to building the house they all shut that down, including transportation, and said, sorry, it's considered a triangle. You are not allowed to put your driveway there. It's okay that I'm forced to only go on one spot, which is going to be the northwest side. However, if I go on the northwest side, there's a tree right in the middle, and there's also three guy wires. All you're seeing now, the third guy wire I had to take and remove. I had to get that by Bell Communications in order to at least give me a single car driveway because dealing with forestry, they said I could keep a 1.8 meter clearance away from that tree, and I wanted at least a one meter clearance away from the guy there. So it was a three foot clearance and a six foot, which only gave me a very modest three meters, not even, and a single car driveway to a double. Unfortunately, with the pace, it's very tough for my wife and myself. With our car, we can't even, two double car garage on a single, because originally we offset the design of our house architecturally to offset the garage so that we can accommodate these guy wires. In doing so, it then was a end result of the, so I can't even get my second out of my driveway. I have to move it every morning in order for my wife to get out. And there's no parking. I also want to make mention, also no street parking allowed on clues. I, I face Bombardier, which is just north of myself. So there's absolutely no street parking allowed on clues and on Garrett, Obviously, Bombardier runs pretty much 24-7, so there's planes coming in and out every every hour of the day. Um, I cannot park on Garrett as well. So, I, like, like I said, I'm forced to just park strictly on my driveway, and I, I, I can only fit, as you can see through the illustration. Um, to your comments for the progression, I'm, all, I'm in favor of... of replacing this tree for five replacement trees or whatever it may be. I actually have a, a landscaping design already created that'll bolster everything. It's got about 12 critical side feeders. I got 10 beech wood, purple beaches. I have hydrangeas. I have dwarf fountain grass. I got limelights. I got everything going in this property. So I'm in favor of the trees, to be honest. I just, like I said, with this one being directly located there, as I said earlier, it was the only location, not the preferred, for myself when I was building.
I also, when I went in for my uh, zoning certificate, I applied through my siting uh, tree to be removed. I received the permit and everything. So I was always under the impression that I was allowed to get removed because they were always told me, just when you go through planning, you go through everything, apply that you want to get removed, do everything. And I, I, I have done all that. But unfortunately, I, I just wanted to go the right way. I did everything, tree protection. And then as I was going through the whole process, I just kept getting, I uh, kept hitting a dead end. I kept saying that it's, uh, not to be removed. So that's why we're here today. All right. Um, is that it? Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the deputant? Yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry. Did you have more? You're done. Are you finished? No, I know I hadn't. Uh, or did we lose? Did we lose the communication? I thought it was done. Correct. Correct. Oh, I'm sorry. Are Are you finished, or are you have more? No, I'm here. I'm all finished. You're done. Okay. So, uh, are there any questions for the deputy? Yes, I'm finished. I'm finished. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for the deputy? I have a couple, but um, I'll let other councillors go first. So, uh, uh, the question for staff. Okay, questions for staff from Councillor Carroll. Um, so, normally, when we when we permit uh, the, a tree removal, there's a tree replacement policy. Um, are you open to to adhering to the uh, tree replacement policy? Yes, I am. You are. Now, I noticed that, I guess the, I see two cars in the driveway, yes. um, and they're, uh, they're somehow, I guess, weaving in and out of that driveway, unless, unless the car on the right-hand side of the screen is permanently parked there, which I highly doubt. Um, do, you, do you see a long-term risk to this tree if, if, if cars or visitors are coming in and out of there sort of trying to weave around it? Well, of course. Especially, especially with the guy wires, with the hitting and the branches, they, they grow and they actually, I can't even fit a pickup truck. They always hit the branches, everything. So I'm actually very nervous about it. That sharp turn that you see, believe it or not, it's, it's a really big blind, blind spot when backing out. So I have to move that large, uh, the Mazda CX-9 out of the driveway first, then I can move the Mazda CX-3. Okay. Cannot, I have to, otherwise it's, it's, very, very dangerous. Yeah. Um, are there are there risks to uh, regarding pedestrian sight lines as this tree grows? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, those are my questions. Um, thank you very much. There's no other questions from other councillors, and we can go to um, questions for staff. Uh, Councillor Carroll, I believe you're, you have questions for staff. Yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Um, in the, the staff submission, it says that the, the yellow guy wire has been removed, but singular. Are, are you referring to the one in the, in the photo attached to the report? There's one that looks like it's in the middle of where the new driveway would be. That is that that's the one you're referring to? Uh, three, Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. Uh, there were initially oh. three guy wires. Uh, one being closest to the road and sort of parallel to the curb, uh, the other two extending towards the uh, dwelling, which are still present. Okay. And the way that the, the picture that the applicant provided, there's a driveway there. It looks kind of like, uh, uh, for lack of a technical term, it looks like a downtown driveway where you've got a single driveway, which is basically our DIPS policy and then sort of a, a front yard parking pad attached to it. It kind of looks like that. Um, is that approved? Is that, was that, you know, the intention was to save the tree and so they allowed him a single car driveway and said, and you can pave this portion beside it as well. Is that, is that a, 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 an attempt to ameliorate the situation? Uh, I believe that the original application came through showing a full width driveway uh, which would require the removal of the tree, and that was what was on the plans that uh, went to buildings. 
um, urban forestry, uh, in the situation of a healthy city owned tree, uh, urban forestry isn't necessarily bound by the permits that building issues. And uh, right. our decision uh, our decision was that a single car uh, with driveway, acknowledging that it may not be convenient, um, would be uh, would be something that would allow the tree to be retained. And so we have refused the application and we're deferring the matter to council. Right. And so, um, uh, well, my own home has a single car uh, driveway and we, we have to move the two cars in and out if, you know, if I'm leaving and he's leaving, that sort of thing. Um, uh, because we're only allowed that much curb cut. And I know that's the case for a lot of residents in my ward. In this area, or do we know, if we were to remove this tree, um, would there not be some, some, uh, uh, um, some policy issues around allowing him to have a double wide curb cut anyway? I would have to defer to transportation on that. Is there anyone on transportation that, that could comment, Mr. Chair? I do apologize, um, Councillor Carroll. Um, could you uh, repeat the question uh, at a clarity's sake? Well, I'm just wondering if there's anyone that could comment from transportation. Uh, the removal of the tree, sort of, uh, the knock-on effect would be that the that the applicant, I would assume, would be then asking to make his uh, driveway two cars wide and have a double-sized curb cut. Is, is would that would that be allowable under our policies anyway? Well, if if uh, I know I that see... in, in most of my ward, it is not. Okay, well, uh, uh, Mr. Clement is here. Maybe he can um, clarify uh, transportation. Yes, uh, through the chair, um, I do apologize. I was unfamiliar with the background of this issue, specifically um, as it relates to transportation services. So I cannot advise at this time. I don't have our, oh, okay. our front yard park and staff on hand. So I do apologize. No problem, no problem. Long time no see, Dan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Those are my questions. Mr. All right. Chair. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cole. Uh, sorry, Councillor Carroll. Um, any other questions for staff? Um, I have a couple. Um, should we grant um, the removal of this tree? Our tree replacement plan is five to one. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. So they'd have to plant five five new trees on the property. It's a, that's our recommendation to council in the event that council were to choose to allow the removal. Um, our preference, uh, very clear preference uh, for urban forestry is that replacement trees for city tree removals be planted in the city road allowance. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, and uh, the. Um, and, and not on private property. Um, in, in this situation, if the uh, five trees that we are recommending uh, and to which the applicant appears agreeable could not be planted on the road allowance, um, we would probably look to a mix of actual plantings in the road allowance, if possible, and cash in lieu of any trees that couldn't be planted in the road allowance. Okay. And have you spoken to the homeowner? Are they amenable to the tree replacement uh, conditions? Uh, I don't know specifically uh, because I haven't had any correspondence with them since this came to council. All right. Now, you're the tree expert, not me, but I, I look at where that tree is, right beside a driveway, right beside a sidewalk. I see the cars that are going to have to kind of weave in and out. What is, what is the likelihood of, of this tree surviving uh, over the years under those conditions? I would say that that likelihood rests entirely on the uh, whether or not the users of the driveway respect the edge of the driveway. Um, the area that has been paved, paved in asphalt, we gave conditional approval to that. It lies outside of the tree's tree protection zone. Um, if the uh, if they were to be driving over the soft landscape that has been retained around the tree. 
uh, I think that that would, uh, that would harm the tree, uh, both in the short and the long term. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions for staff? And now we can go to speakers. Uh, are there speakers on the item? Well, I, I, will, I will speak, and I think based on my questions to the deputant and to staff, I think councillors know, know where I'm going. Um, I, I have visited uh, at the site with my staff. We've taken a close look at it. Uh, we're, we're concerned about the long-term potential for this tree to, to survive in its current location. This is um, a problem between planning and forestry. They were given all their approvals to build this driveway. There's obviously a sidewalk there. Um, knowing how some of these trees can grow and that it being right sort of plunk at the end of a driveway, sight lines, pedestrian sight lines are a major problem as a tree grows and, it's, and, and the canopy extends outward and down. Uh, I can see that being uh, an ongoing uh, problem. There seems to be some kind of miscommunication uh, in this application with, with planning, uh, which is sort of beyond the scope of what we're discussing here. And, um, and I think the, uh, I know, or if he's, you know, I've spoken to the owner and he certainly um, uh, will, will adhere to conditions of removal by planting five, five new trees. So we would gain um, five new trees and we'd be removing what, uh, what looks like a tree that's not going to survive much longer. So I'm going to be moving uh, approval of the request to remove the city-owned tree with, with conditions uh, uh, based on our tree, uh, tree replacement program. I guess there's some money here that has to be handed over as well. Um, and that's, um, that's my motion. Any other speakers on the item? Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's put it to a vote. Uh, all those in favor? All those opposed? That loses on a tie. Item number 14, uh, we have deputants on this item. Um, Terry Mueller. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Mr. Mueller. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mr. Mueller. Yes. Yes. So, uh, thank you for joining us. You have uh, you have five minutes. Uh, just just for context, um, are you are you the homeowner or a neighbor or? I am the homeowner. Homeowner. Okay. Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much um, for joining us. Uh, you uh, have five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> Myself, along with my wife, have owned and lived at 18 Rayburn for the past 14 years. The house has needed upgrading since we moved in. And after a lot of thought, we decided to build a new home so that we can have the most energy efficient and healthy home possible. Passive House Standard provides this, using 90% 90, 90 less energy to run than an average home and with a virtually airtight building taking in fresh air and exhausting stale air 24 hours a day makes for a healthy environment to live in. If we don't meet the strict criteria for certification, we can't call it a passive house. Why is this important? Better Homes TO website partnered with the City of Toronto and Natural Resources Canada states by 2050, all Toronto homes need to be near net zero emissions. It also refers to passive house and debt. Building this passive house now will achieve this goal 30 years ahead of schedule. The Toronto Green Standard, although aimed at multi-residential homes, states passive house standard 
is being considered as an alternative path in a future version of the National Energy Code of Canada. We've designed this home to fit into the existing architecture of the neighborhood. Reaching past the post certification on a single family dwelling is much harder to do than on larger multi-residential buildings, apartments, schools, gymnasiums, etc. Therefore, the five principles of passive house de design get maxed out. When we originally presented to urban forestry, we could not meet certification with, without removing and replacing the two coniferous trees, one with a four inch caliber, about 15 inch high deciduous tree. We needed the sun to shine into the windows to help heat the house in the winter. When challenged by urban forestry, we went and looked over the passive house program to see where we could improve. Seeking out higher performing windows was what we could do. With that, we just make it under our certification requirement. Despite prefabricated walls, high quality materials, and trail, trained passive house trades people, it is still construction with all its realities. It makes for a very close margin, whereas with changing out the trees, it is achievable. The first passive house built is now 29 years old and has maintained its original energy efficiency. These homes are designed to last a long time. It makes sense to change out these coniferous trees now, not only because of the immediate energy gains, but in the long term, additional gains are going to be had because of this, this deciduous canopy will be much larger than the coniferous, offering greater shade and energy efficiency in the summer. In the 14 years in this neighborhood, I've seen similar trees the size we want to plant, now towering over houses. Making the switch now ensures the correct tree will be planted for maximum gain over time. I see us having and, having and achieve the same goals as urban forestry. It is just a different way of going about it. One of which is by saving 7,299 kilograms of carbon dioxide per annum over our old house. It helps solve the problem of carbon emissions. Not every passive house project is going to have the need to remove and replace coniferous trees on its southern exposure. I think it would be rare. I understand the intent of the bylaw, and I think it is a different circumstance that hasn't been presented before. My wife and I understand the value and beauty of trees and are good with the urban forestry's recommend, recommended compensation package, which will help expand Toronto's canopy. I think it would be great a great benefit to the City of Toronto to have a certified passive house registered in the Passive House Inst Institute database. It appears Toronto's goal is to achieve some tremendous gains in energy efficiency. To show it is being done and achievable now will inspire others in the city to build in this scientifically engineered manner and therefore jumpstart jump start the city's goals. As time goes on with the advancement of technology, it will only get easier to meet passive house certification and therefore meet our goals of, of global goals of carbon reduction. Thank okay. you, that is okay. what I'd like to speak to. Thank you, um, thank you very much uh, for your deputation. Uh, are there any questions for the deputant? No? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Melissa Furukawa, we have her, yes, from the Peel Passive House Consulting Limited. Melissa? Melissa? Uh, I, Melissa, I believe you're on mute. I think she's on mute. She's on mute. Melissa, can you hear us? Okay. Uh, Melissa, if you can hear us, we're going to come back to you in a couple of minutes, and we're going to go to the next deputy. Andrew Peel, can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? Mr. Peel? 
Yes, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much for joining us. Your five minutes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so um, I'll speak on behalf of uh, the homeowner. Um, we all recognize that action on climate change is, is imperative. And, and Passive House is a key tool in addressing climate change. Uh, the Toronto Green Standard is a great policy instrument developed by the city, but it doesn't cover single-family home. There's a policy gap. The homeowners, Terry and Nancy, could have done a conventional home with much greater environmental impacts. Instead, they are volunteering to be the first certified, uh, uh, to, yeah, to be the first to certify their building to the Passive House Standard. No one has committed to date to do this uh, to this goal. They're actually willing to invest their hard-earned money to do something the city wants and needs, to pave a path for others and demonstrate what's possible. Achieving certification is an important goal for numerous reasons. From a policy perspective, the first certified pastors in Vancouver helped spur uh, Vancouver pastors policy and adoption of the pastors building standard. Uh, Vancouver now has over 2 million square feet of passive house in development, including a 60-story high-rise project, uh, as far as I'm aware, the tallest proposed in the world. All because people saw it's possible and that it delivered on its promise. So they've started to apply the standard to other projects. Uh, the value of the property will increase with passive house certification. Uh, falling short of passive house standard means the property won't be recognized by the market, as there will be no third parties verification. We've seen this with near passive house uh, passive houses in other markets. Uh, greenwashing is rampant, so certification is, is critical to market trust. Uh, the expansion of passive house across the city provides uh, wider benefits to the city than the existing uh, two trees. Um, I'll emphasize, I uh, said that we do not intend to set a precedent to encourage uh, tree replacement on uh, future projects. Uh, we are merely proposing this uh, on this individual case as a necessary means for achieving much greater benefit uh, for the city and for the globe. So that's me then. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Peel. Any questions for the deputant? Uh, Councillor Carroll? You're on mute. You have to unmute your mic. Sorry about that, I'm having trouble getting my mic button up on the screen. <laughs> um, yes, the, the, the report that we have from staff says that, uh, that you were not able to provide the, the in, I guess they were asking for it in writing, you were not able to, to provide the actual design design options have not been obtained from the applicant to demonstrate that the only way to meet the passive house standards is by removing these two trees um have you subsequently been able to provide that uh, this is actually melissa hopefully she did she is actually connected i don't know why she was in trouble um with the audio uh, she was going to speak more about kind of the what we've looked at in terms of uh, further trying to optimize uh, optimize the design, but I'm not sure. I don't believe um, uh, that the the result of that investigation was submitted to Urban Forestry. Okay, and um, uh, this house should I assume that the photographs in the uh, in the the staff report before us um, show. The previous house is. Are there been? Have there been uh, external alterations to the house that we can't see here? I think Terry, if you're, I don't know if he he can speak more to the existing uh, situation. Well, we're we're. I'm actually. I'm at, since you're a passive house consulting, I'm I'm assuming you had some involvement in it. The the difficulty is we don't actually jump back and forth between uh, the, the deputants. So I, I'm asking okay. the questions of you because I thought you were the consultant on the house. Should I save these questions for Melissa then? She's got more detailed information about the actual um, uh, project. Okay, so because she, she is going to be able to take the floor uh, soon, so so I can wait. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Are there any uh, other questions for this deputant? We're going to try and get uh, uh, Melissa back on the line in, in, in a minute. But any other questions for this deputant? No? Okay. So, uh, Melissa, can you hear us?
Ms. Furukawa. Melissa? Hello? Uh, Melissa? Ms. Furukawa? Can she Hi, can you hear me? Uh, Ms. Furukawa? Melissa? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> welcome, oh, okay, welcome. Great. Okay, good, we, fi we finally got you time. there. Go ahead, you have five minutes. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, so the City of Toronto report argues that mature trees reduce energy consumption. The report also argues that air conditioning costs are reduced with shaded homes and heating costs are reduced when trees mitigate the cooling effects of the winter wind. Although trees can reduce cooling required in summer by shading the home, a deciduous tree with a larger canopy will provide much more shading in the summer than the current coniferous trees. Furthermore, in the winter, the solar gain from the sun has a much greater value than protection from the wind since the building will be very airtight um, in order to meet the passive house requirements. The coniferous trees will shade a significant amount of the winter sun and therefore increase the heating costs of the home. Other benefits stated in the report will be maintained by the requirement to replace the two deciduous trees with 10, sorry, the two coniferous trees with 10 uh, tree replacements. These include softening the hard lines of the building form and surfaces, contributing to the overall character and quality of the neighborhood, reducing runoff, heat island effect, temperature extremes, cleansing of the air, noise, wind reduction, and protection from UV radiation. Furthermore, the report um, outlines that mature trees increase the property value. Um, we would argue that the passive house certification would uh, also increase, if not further increase, the property value. Um, the report also states that it is the goal of the City of Toronto to increase the city's tree canopy by 40 percent, um, since it was required that uh, we replace the two coniferous trees with 10 uh, trees, this would also contribute to this goal. I just also want to highlight that our design is highly optimized. It represents a high performance home. Uh, we have triple pane windows with an effective R value of eight, a compact design, heat recovery ventilation, high performance thermal envelope, including above grade walls with an R effective of 68, below grade walls with an R effective of 58, a uh, roof with R effective of 85, 83, and a floor with R effective of 58. Um, we've also carefully designed the junctions between the walls and the roof and the walls and the floor to ensure that it's thermal bridge free um, and detailed all the connections to ensure there's a continuous air barrier to meet our air tightness requirement for passive house. Um, we have also, um, <clears throat> model the effects of these uh, coniferous trees. So with the coniferous trees, um, we are reaching a spacing demand of 15.5, which is just over the passive house limit of 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared annum. If we replace these coniferous trees with deciduous trees, we can reduce our spacing demand by 12.9, no, sorry, to 12.9 kilowatt hours per meter squared annum and be on track to meeting uh, passive house certification. Uh, we also looked at um, if we were to, as Terry mentioned, um, swap out uh, the current windows to, or the current design windows to a higher performance window, which is actually cold climate certified, um, which obviously uh, has an increased cost. These are kind of the best available on the market um, in Canada, and this would only decrease our spacing and demand to 14.5. So although this, we could potentially meet certification, it leaves very little wiggle room for um, any uh, construction changes which are uh, pretty much inevitable um, and it would be 
cutting things quite close. Um, we also investigated, um, so the air tightness requirement for passive house is 0 0.6 air changes per hour. We also investigated what if, what if we could improve that, um, get get it down to 0 0.4, which is, you know, meaning the passive house target is a is a feat of its own, um, and uh, there's no, it's not a design issue is it's a construction issue and um we can't really know until we construct it what until we do the the test the blower door test what uh, level we meet but if we were to decrease it to 0 0.4 if we were able to meet that target then our spacing and demand would decrease to 14.4 um so again we would be just right on the line so i don't know this just highlights that the most impactful thing that we can do is replace the deciduous trees with uh sorry the coniferous trees with deciduous trees and this is a uh, fundamental in the design principles of passive house, which is to uh, shade the solar uh, heat gains in the summer and allow solar heat gains to enter the home in the winter to help offset heating. Okay. Thank you. Um, yep, you're just pretty well at five minutes. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the deputant? Uh, Councillor Carroll. Yes. So uh, I, I was trying to get from um, from the other consultant. So it's this is this new house built? We're we're looking at pictures of the original house, I believe. Oh yeah, no, the house is not uh, built yet. We're in the design uh, phase. So you're still in design phase. I'm I'm wondering if you could comment on my question earlier. The um, the the staff indicate in their report that that you were unable to provide to them um, the design reason for why this is necessary why, why they have not it says design options have not been obtained from the applicant to demonstrate that this is the only way to meet the passive house standard yes um so like i can speak to that so we have uh since since seeing that you know gone through some iterations of what can we do and one of those options is um like i said in my five minute speech, um, installing better performing windows. Um, and like I mentioned before, we're just under the target using that. And it, from our experience as passive house consultants, um, it is not a recommendation to move into construction, cutting it so close to, to the target because inevitably construction changes come up um, and we really um, recommend to have more more wiggle room moving out of design into construction. Okay, so um, you if it, you know if you work in the environmental space, you know why we have a tree policy. Mm. Uh, one of these spruces is is huge, and while it's uh, true, it's a coniferous tree. It 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 it, it really is a it has a huge crown and and is is uh, providing. Uh, some paid, um, but but with your understanding of environment policy, um, you can understand that 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 we're struggling with this. That we have to jeopardize an environmental policy to meet another inventor, environmental policy. But the, but the question I have around that is, we have a Toronto Green Standard, and we even have step ups. Uh, uh, Toronto Atmospheric Fund uh, uh, helped us to provide increased tiers. Our goal is to get to you know tiers one, two, and three of of the Green Standard. Um, we don't have a uh, we don't have a requirement that we get to passive, but we have environmental policy. We desperately need tree canopy to get to 40%. And so we have environmental policy around trees. We do have environmental policy around structure, but it doesn't require to get all the way to passive. Um, uh, why do we need to get all the way to passive with this house versus just achieving the things that you've outlined in your five minute deputation that I did listen to very carefully? So, sorry, why, just to why, why do we why do, why we, do we need, need certification? To that ensure one? that you get the certification. Mm. Well, I think as Andrew, so I missed Andrew's presentation, but I think as Andrew mentioned, this would be the first certified passive house in Toronto. So it sets a precedence for other people to also see that it is achievable, see like okay. an example project. Um, usually we host passive house open days to spread the word about passive house, which is a great kind of um, avenue for people to 
um, meet the the goals that we need to meet in order to um, combat climate change. Um, so but do you have change. any concern that in order to that in order to meet one standard, we'd actually have to jeopardize the environment by and set a, a bad precedent uh, with another one of our environmental policies? Is that a concern? Um, I mean, I think, well, just from my own uh, personal opinion, I guess, because we would be replacing the, the two trees with 10 trees, um, I think that would kind of offset, I guess, the negative environmental impact of, of taking down those trees. And I, I really do feel like the environmental impact of moving to passive house and being an example um for other to like create this movement in toronto for other people to also um consider passive house certification is a much greater um is a much greater impact okay those are my questions thank you mr chair thank you thank you thank you uh thank you councillor carroll um any other questions for the deputant? No? Any questions for staff? Nope. So, um, any speakers other than me? I'm, I'm going to defer this item. Um, originally, my my motion was to do two things. One was to approve the uh, removal, but also at the same time have staff um, come back uh, with a policy on what we do with houses, um, houses of this nature and style, passive houses, which of course uh, we support. Um, it aligns with our transform uh, TO policy. It aligns uh, with our climate change strategies. And uh, this is the kind of thing that we want throughout the city. We want creativity. We want innovation. And as Councillor Carroll mentions, it's a we're in we're in a dilemma and a paradox where uh, an environmentally friendly um, initiative cannot proceed without the removal of trees. Um, so I, I'm going to defer it to the next um, community council meeting because my plan is. It can to, proceed. It's sorry. just not going to be. Sorry, I'm going to defer it to the next community council meeting and try and get clarity on what we can do uh, with our city bylaw, our tree bylaw, and 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 put a provision in there uh, to to account and get clarity on these kinds of situations uh, because it would be great if more passive houses uh, were built. There's a, a one already up and operating uh, in Ward Six. It's a remarkable. Uh, it's a remarkable home, um, and this is exactly what we want uh, for, for the future. So uh, with your support, I'd like to defer this and, uh, and, and bring it back, uh, I guess it would be September. Uh, all those in favor? That carries. Okay, we just have a couple of items left. Um, I have... Dean, do you have them on the line? Yes, okay, so we're going to item 15. Uh, request to demolish non-residential building at 911X Castlefield Drive. And we have um, Patrick um, Bernicke, Bernicke, architectural technologist, Hydro One Networks, Inc. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Hello. Oh, you can hear us. Great. Thank you very much. Um, just for context, um, are you the homeowner or? Uh, I'm basically employed by Hydro One and uh, I'm the authorized property uh, or basically the authorized agent to take care of the property uh, applications and whatnot. You're, you're with Hydro One and this is a single story building. Okay, so Hydro One owns this building? Yes, so it's a Hydro One property, and uh, I'm behind Hydro One to take care of building permit applications. Okay, thank you for coming. You have five minutes. 
Thank you. Um, so this is a part of the permit uh, 2146336. Uh, and uh, Hydro One is applying for an, uh, an application to demolish a 18 square meter uh, old, uh, sorry, 18, 18 square meter oil building that's decommissioned and it's been sitting there for many years. And um, it, it's a three meter tall building. And uh, Hydro One is doing work on the station and expanding to uh, accommodate for future expansion within the area, uh, such as Metrolink's uh, LRT line and the growing number of customers on that uh, Toronto Hydro customers. So uh, we need to tear down this building, and it's uh, it's basically the, we need an extension from the former city of York's demolition bylaw. Uh, and to, in order to tear down this building, we need the space on the, the property to uh, construct uh, electrical equipment that will uh, facilitate the loading of new uh, future customers on, in the area. And um, we do not intend on re replacing the building. It's, it used to actually just filter old oil in the, on the property, but we've gone away from those old and we've uh, decommissioned the building so it's no longer in use. It's just sitting there. It's an old mill shed. Um, a lot of the work is, a lot of the electrical equipment is being moved into a new building that's being under construction on site right now. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for my notes. It's, I think we can um, need to quickly look here. Okay. Um, uh, thank also, I just want to add that we're replacing end of life equipment and we're building the whole, the whole station. So uh, a lot of the electrical stations that are being replaced in the area are being moved into that new building. So um, I'll take it from there. I don't know if there's anything else. That, uh, I think my colleague is on the line too. I don't know if she wants to add anything. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Bernicke. Uh, any, any questions for the deputant? Uh, Councillor Cole. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, this was an old oil building. What does that mean? What was in there? What was it used for? Um, hello, my... Yes, yes this is uh, my, my, uh, my colleague, Christina, is on the line as well. Um, my name is Christina Stanek. I'm the project manager with Hydro One in charge of the uh, rebuilding of the Fairbank TS yes, uh, transmission station. And uh, the oil shed um, that was at, that is at site and um, that we would like to demolish used to house oil equipment that was uh, used to uh, filtrate and fill oil breakers and transformers at site. There was no, uh, that method is no longer used and we, uh, all the pipes have been cut and decommissioned and the equipment has been removed. And uh, this is uh, one last piece of the old puzzle to be removed. Uh, what about, uh, there were uh, PCB concerns uh, on that side years ago. Are there any, uh, methods you're using to ensure that when you decommission this building that you don't have uh, a, uh, a PCB or some other uh, contaminant uh, issue uh, resulting from the demolition of this building? Yes, we have a designated substance uh, list um, associated with this building and uh, all the pipes and the foundation. And uh, that the um, the demolition itself will be contracted out to, um, to a contractor who is uh, trained in this uh, particular type of removal. And uh, the contractor has been provided with all the uh, necessary information in order to do a safe removal. Okay, uh, and uh, have you notified the nearby residents about uh, this uh, uh, removal, if granted, uh, would you do that? And would you explain uh, what you're doing to the site? I think there was some notice that went out generally, but has there been a mailing to the residents uh, on Danesbury, on Castlefield, on Roselawn uh, about uh, the uh, Hydro One project there? So we have notified the, uh, the residents um, and uh, the city officials 
about uh, the project, the upcoming project, before the project has started. We have um, uh, identified that we are rebuilding the station and uh, we are going to house most of the equipment inside a new building that we have approved the uh, building permit and we are in the um, in during construction right now. Uh, we have sent another notification when the contractor starting the new building has, uh, just before the contractor has started the work, we have notified the, uh, the residents. And another letter just went out regarding another demolition across the, the property. Um, that is another uh, old, old building um, decommissioned. So uh, we did not notify the um, residents about the oil shed because we wanted to first obtain the demolition permit and we wanted to ensure we have the proper um, schedule in place. And once that is, um, we have everything, we will notify again with another letter to residents in the area. Okay, thank you. And what about, uh, your, you also own the property to the south, uh, on uh, the south side of Roselawn, backing onto the York Beltline Park, is that not correct? Um, and 901 Roselawn, are you referring? Yes. Yes, the one that we have a building uh, demolition permit in effect and we're starting the demolition of that building. Uh, so you're, you're starting the demolition of that building and uh, you're going to construct a new building there? No, there is, uh, there is no uh, need for a building. That area, um, it's going to be used during the construction of the Fairbank uh, transmission station. It's going to be used as a laydown area, and just for uh, office trailers and some um, um, containers for material storage. So that ugly, dilapidated building next to 855 <laughs> yes. Roselawn is going to be uh, demolished. Yes, then cleaned up. And when will you remove the railway tracks off of Roselawn Avenue that haven't been used since 1962? There have been uh, no uh, um, no plan for that, um, for the removal of the railroad tracks. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the work that we're doing now. It wasn't something that we uh, we looked at. But uh, what do you need the railway tracks there for? There's no railroad. The, yeah, the railroad tracks, I believe there used to be um, for bringing in transformers as a sighting, but uh, I'm not sure if it's still in use, probably not. It hasn't been used since 1962, so you still, you don't need railway tracks, which uh, cause all kinds of uh, damage to the road and uh, uh, et cetera there. Can you remove those railway tracks? I, I will definitely bring that recommendation to uh, Hydro One. All right, and, Councillor. Uh, um, make inquiries. Councillor Cole, you're, you're way over time. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Any other questions for the deputant? No? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, any questions for staff? Any speakers on the item? Councillor Cole. Uh, yes. Uh, certainly the uh, rebuilding the Fairbank Transformer Station there at Marley and uh, Roselawn uh, Castlefield is uh, required given the new uh, Eglin Crosstown and uh, other uh, needs for, for hydro in the area. So I, I'm uh, totally supportive of uh, giving them a, a permit to do that, the demolition permit. Uh, uh, the problem is that this site uh, has been a problem site for the community and that Hydro One has not... Moving number one taking care of that property, especially so. the uh, adjacent substation to the south where we've had this uh, run down uh, uh, eyesore there for decades uh, that uh, has been overgrown with weeds. And, uh, and again, it's attached even to a defunct railway. Uh, you know, we're going back, uh, I don't know how many decades. So what I would hope that uh, I would like to put uh, allow this uh, uh, demolition permit to be given on the condition that uh, the uh, Hydro uh, One uh, 
in consultation with our staff, look at the possibility of removing the railway tracks that haven't been used in uh, 50 years off of Roselawn Avenue as part of the condition uh, to uh, uh, give them the demolition permit and also that they uh, do some appropriate uh, greening of the uh, area, especially on the south side where the uh, dilapidated uh, old uh, structure uh, is on the south side of 901 Roselawn. So those are, uh, I would like uh, Hydro One to consult with our staff on the possibility of doing some planting and uh, greening on the south side uh, of uh, 901 uh, there, Roselawn, and getting rid of those uh, unused railway tracks, because uh, I don't think the railway is coming back. All right, um, just for clarity, Councillor Cole, uh, are you moving uh, option one, approve the application to demolish with the following conditions, and there's A to F? Yes. Okay. And those then... conditions about removing and uh, looking into removing the railway tracks in consultation with city staff and um, proper greening and planting uh, in front of uh, yeah. the uh, site at 901 uh, sure. Roselawn, which is okay. all part of the same. Uh, uh, Hydro One property. It goes from Castlefield all the way down to the York Belt Line. Okay, um, beautification. I think would cover that. And you've asked for an amendment for them to consider uh, removing the tracks. Yes. Um, okay, we can. I think we can plug that in. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so we're going to um, move. Uh, you're moving option one. Approve the application to demolish with the following conditions. And then we're going to uh, add an item there, uh, consider um, removing the railway tracks, and they will know what that means. Yes. Is there something else? Well, that's, that's, it's covered under um, C, beautification. I assume your comments regarding planting is, is covered under C, beautification. Yes. Okay. B and C. Three, A, B and C. Okay. Um, Roselawn is an adjoining street to Castlefield? Yeah, Roselawn is just the south. Just south, okay. Okay. So their property extends uh, two blocks, basically, from Castlefield down to Roselawn to the south to the York Beltline Trail to the south. West right. of Marley. All right, um, so um, item option option one is being option one is being moved uh, with a small amendment. And all those in favor? Oh, we'll get it on the screen. There we go. I'm sure they'll love the one about the railway tracks. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Uh, we can now move to the next uh, demolition. Um, number 16, uh, eight and six, Croham Road. And there was a speaker originally, but that speaker is not speaking. Uh, so we can go to questions for staff. Uh, Councillor Cole? I, I just want to speak. Uh, okay, so no questions for staff. Um, speakers, Councillor Cole, and if you could let us yes, know. Yes, this is the. Uh, which, which um, do you know which one you're moving? I, I'm moving uh, uh, basically uh, the um, request uh, that just be moved without approvals. Without any conditions, 
Uh, oh, demolition without conditions? Yes. Um, I guess that's number two. Okay. Yes. So you're moving um, recommendation two. Okay. Yes. The, yes, the, the, I'm moving. It's uh, part of the uh, new uh, interchange uh, station uh, on the uh, Eglin Crosstown at Caledonia, which connects to the GO system. That's going to be a major public transit hub there at the West Side Mall, uh, connecting, again, east and west, north and south. So it's going to be quite a, uh, a critical interchange uh, station there on the new Crosstown line. Uh, and so these two houses are needed uh, for uh, a platform uh, boarding area uh, to access the new uh, transportation uh, hub there. Uh, the only thing I'd like to ask that uh, we asked, the that's why the deputy isn't here, but uh, that's Metrolinx, uh, that they inform uh, the, uh, the nearby residents on uh, uh, what will uh, take place with the demolition, why they're undertaking the demolition, and why it's needed for the new uh, Caledonia interchange station. I just want them to notify the residents uh, of uh, why this uh, land is needed for the new transportation hub. That's all I really want to ask for. Okay, uh, Councillor Cole, thank you very much. Uh, any other speakers on the item? No? Um, Councillor Cole has uh, moved recommendation two, approval the, approve the application to demolish a single family dwelling without any conditions. Motion is on the screen. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. Um, item 17. Uh, that is another demolition, 515 Glen Cairn. Um, I don't have any deputants on the list for this item, so we'll go to questions for staff. Uh, yes, if I could ask just staff. Yeah, um, Councillor Cole. Uh, yes, uh, so this is, uh, again, the demolition of this uh, residential property on the uh, west uh, side of the uh, uh, parcel in question here, running south from Glen Cairn uh, at the corner of uh, Bathurst. Uh, is this going to be the future site of uh, the proposed park that's part of the uh, development? Through the chair to uh, council, the the proposed uh, use of the lot is for the underground uh, is the mid-rise development location. Uh, it doesn't specifically mention whether it's for the parkland location, but the purpose of the remedi or the removal is so that soil remediation can take place. Uh, yes, uh, you know, it was my understanding that that's where the park was going to go on the west side of the property. Uh, uh, so therefore. Uh, uh, I, I guess the only concern I have is that uh, they uh, clean up sod and um, uh, certainly put up any uh, hoarding or required, uh, so I'm fine with that. So uh, you don't have anything to add to, to anything else we should be doing before we grant this? Uh, through the Chair of the Council, I think that would suffice in regards to the, uh, st uh, the standards that we would ask Council to impose. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cole. Any other questions for staff? No. Um, speakers? I just Councilor like to Cole, speak briefly, this, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Did you uh, want to pick from this uh, list of staff recommendations? <laughs> I'll cherry pick here. Yeah, I'll uh, uh, choose uh, door number three. Uh, we approve the application uh, to demolish the single family dwellings with the following conditions. The usual erecting of fencing, uh, uh, removal of debris, and uh, keeping it clear of weeds, etc., uh, and uh, any uh, holes backfilled. So I would uh, recommend number three. This is a uh, much supported uh, new development uh, at that corner. Uh, the site of the old, uh, your old uh, bowling uh, hangout, uh, Mr. Chairman, Bowlerama. I'm sure you were there, Mr. Jack Fine, in the day. 
So uh, uh, we're getting a new uh, upscale uh, local uh, condominium built there for the area. Uh, okay, great. Um, so um, staff recommendation number three is before us, approval to demolish with conditions. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. That was the last item uh, for the day. We will enact the bylaws. Members, of the, I have a motion to introduce and enact certain bills that North York Community Council passed and declared as a bylaw. Bill 521, prepared for July 15, 2020, meeting 16 of Community Council. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw? All those in favor? Can't see Councillor. Uh, oh, it's just the four, three of us left. Four of us left. Okay, members, I have a motion that is carried. Um, members, I have a motion to introduce and enact the confirming bill that North York Community Council passed and declares bylaw confirmatory bill to confirm the legislative proceedings of North York Community Council acting under delegated authority at meeting 16 on July 15, 2020. Shall this bill be passed and declared as a bylaw? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. That concludes our business for today. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, city clerk staff. Thank you, other staff. Thank you, members of the public, for tuning in. Have a safe day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're most welcome. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt you so many times last time. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's quite all right. It's, it's actually.